Hey guys, welcome back to Supposedly Fun. I am Greg, here today to do a tag video. It is the favorite musicals tag. I was tagged by Sean the Book Maniac. I will put his video down below. Uh, the original is from Juan over at Just Juan Reader. I will put his video down below. This is a fun tag because it uh, does not have any prompts. It just wants you to talk about musicals and pair them with books. And I love musicals, unlike Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, I grew up with musicals. I've mentioned in my coming out video that I have a gay father, and I think this is an area where that really came out. So I come by it honestly. The first Broadway show I ever saw, I was actually too young to remember. Yule Brenner did a short stint in a revival of The King and I in the 80s, and my father thought it was extremely culturally important for me and my sister to see Yule Brenner performing on Broadway. The failure of that is that I was so young, maybe around three years old, that I have absolutely no memory of that, so I don't actually remember the first Broadway show that I saw. The first ones that I do remember came back to back, and I don't actually remember which one was first, Les Miserables and Phantom of the Opera, both of which are my favorites. I will discuss both of them, but I'm going to save one of them for the end. And just to give you an idea, again, of how much of a fan of musicals my father was, uh, and how funny it is that we had absolutely no idea that he's gay. <laughs> we had a VHS copy of the South Pacific, and he watched it so many times that my little sister ripped all of the tape out of the VHS so he would never be able to make us watch it again. Again, we had no idea he's gay. And also, my sisters and I used to watch The Sound of Music all the time. But it was it was so long that it was one of those two VHS sets, and we used to only watch the first tape, because the first tape ends with Maria getting married to Captain Von Trapp, and that was what we decided the happy ending should be. If you put in the second tape, the Nazis come, they have to leave, it gets really sad and depressing. So we decided to omit that completely. But I have not seen The Sound of Music live, so I'm going to omit it completely. Same thing with South Pacific. I'm only going to talk about things that I have actually seen performed, although in some cases I will also discuss the movie. And that is also the case with the first one I want to talk about, which is Cabaret. Now, Cabaret is my one of my favorite movies of all time, but I also saw it performed. My father took me to see it for my 21st birthday at Studio 54, and it was interesting because the stage show has different plot points than the movie. And because I saw it on Broadway, I can say that I have been mooned by John Stamos because at that time he was playing the MC. There you go. Now obviously Cabaret was inspired by a book which is The Berlin Stories by Christopher Isherwood. These are two novellas. This book was the introduction of the character of Sally Bowles which was adapted into a play called I Am a Camera and then of course Cabaret as we know it. But Cabaret is very different from this book so it's very much inspired by not based on. But that's a little too obvious. So in a couple of these cases where the musical is actually based on a book, I'm going to choose something else. So the way I describe Half-Blood Blues by Essie Adugin is that it is cabaret crossed with Amadeus with a dash of atonement. And because of that element, I'm going to choose it to pair with cabaret. So this is the story of jazz musicians in Germany in the build-up to World War II. And that, I think, is why, in particular, it will, it ties in nicely with Cabaret, because it's very much in that mindset of people who are in Germany or in Europe, and they, they can kind of see what's coming and what's happening, but in some ways they're blind to it, in some ways willingly blind to it, and in some ways they see it but don't really know how they can stop it. And because of that, it is a very interesting thing. Next, let's talk about one of those first musicals I ever saw, which is Les Miserables. This was probably a great musical for me to see first because it is very dazzling in terms of staging. It has really great music. It is a beautiful, beautiful story about um, honor, but it also deals with redemption, and redemption is the through line that I'm going to pick up because a book about redemption is Disgrace by J.M. Cutsey, who later went on to win a Nobel Prize for Literature. Now, Disgrace is an interesting counterpoint to Les Miserables because both novels have protagonists who do something wrong in the beginning and spend the rest of the novel trying to reckon with that. I have not read the book Les Miserables, by the way. I feel I should point that out. Both books are also set in countries that are undergoing a lot of political turmoil. Les Miserables because of the French Revolution, Disgrace because of apartheid in South Africa. But both novels have drastically different approaches to the idea of redemption. Les Mis is a lot more idealistic. Jean Valjean is a flawed character in the beginning, but he becomes uh, a paragon of righteousness by the end. So Les Mis has a much more black and white vision of right and wrong, and good and evil as well. Uh, the protagonist of Disgrace, on the other hand, 
is deeply flawed and the world he lives in has no easy answers. It seems to question then whether or not redemption is even possible. First because we ourselves are so flawed and likely to continue to make mistakes, but also because it's difficult to know what the right thing is or the wrong thing is. And that makes it a very interesting novel. But I think part of what's really interesting about this pairing is that they are, they, they follow similar paths, but in two very different directions. The next musical I want to talk about is My Fair Lady. Now, let me tell you something. I hate My Fair Lady. It's true. The music is wonderful, but the love story kills me every time. Henry Higgins is a horrible person, and I do not think he redeems himself or changes enough to actually deserve to end up with Eliza Doolittle. At the ending of the of the musical when he asks her where his slippers are, I want her to just find those slippers, throw them at his head, and walk out the door. That's how I feel about My Fair Lady. And you know what? In a world where Eliza Doolittle had a gay friend, that's exactly how that musical would end. Just saying. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Memoirs of a Geisha because it's another unlikely, slightly unsettling, romantic pairing, uh, in this case because there's a fairly significant age difference between the lovers and they meet while she's still a child. So that's gross. But, spoiler alert, and nothing happens until she is grown up and both characters are able to uh, choose each other in a consensual way. It does kind of end up making sense that they love each other and uh, end up together. But, and this book is also gorgeous, and it's a very interesting portrayal of Japan through a period of time where things like geishas, uh, which had been very traditional, were kind of going away, and Japan was modernizing. I, I still think it's a, a beautiful and, and interesting book, and I think the romance here ends much better than the one in My Fair Lady. This is my opinion. Next, let's talk about a more recent musical, which is Kinky Boots and uh, pair it with a novel that is also about an unlikely friendship that leads to self-improvement, Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg. Now, a quick fun fact for you. I had seen and loved the movie that is based on this book uh, when I was a teenager, but I, I first fell in love with the author, Fanny Flagg, when I was stuck at home when I was 18 because we moved, to, we moved to New Jersey from San Francisco and I didn't have a driver's license. So I was stuck in the house until I got a driver's license. And what did I do with my time when I was there? I binge watched Match Game, the old classic 70s game show. Oh God, I loved Fanny Flagg so much. She is a quirky delight and this book perfectly matches her personality. It is also a quirky delight. So like Kinky Boots, there's an unlike, uh, unlikely friendship at the center of this that leads to self-improvement, which is why I picked it. This is the story of Evelyn Couch, who is a, a, an unhappily married, middle-aged woman who meets Ninny Threadgood in an old-age home. And Ninny ends up completely revitalizing Evelyn's life because she, because of her friendship, but also because she tells stories about Iggy Threadgood, who was a relative of hers. Uh, who was a tomboy, read lesbian, who had also been the owner of the titular Whistle Stop Cafe. This book is also an ode to how much change a person witnesses over the course of their lifetime. It is also funny and entertaining and heartfelt in ways that really tie in well with Kinky Boots, which is about uh, a son whose father died and, and he leaves him their shoe business, which is dying in a time of great, because factories are having a very hard time. Uh, the shoe business is becoming much more manufactured. People don't necessarily want handcrafted shoes. So he manages to revitalize his business with the friendship, through friendship with a drag queen named Lola, who comes up with the idea that they should be making high-heeled boots that are specifically made for drag queens to support the weight of men who want to wear women's shoes. And both are to have this kind of, that kind of oddball friendship and are just delightful, I think. Next, we have to talk about Rent. The first time I saw Rent, I was living in San Francisco. Rent coming to San Francisco was like Jesus coming down to earth, where everybody was so excited about the show coming. I remember I did the AIDS walk one year and Rent had not even opened yet, but they had the cast come and sing Seasons of Love. And it was it's one of the most amazing concert experiences of my life because the entire crowd was crying and waving along to it. It was, it, it was fantastic. I never saw the actual Broadway show of Rent. My husband did take me 
to see the off-Broadway version. What else am I going to pair with Rent but The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. If you've watched any of my videos you probably saw this coming. Half of this novel is set in 1980s in Chicago but also deals with AIDS at the time and Rent very heavily deals with the AIDS crisis and both are very beautiful humane stories so I love that. But Interestingly, I, I think there's a book on my TBR that would tie in nicely, but I haven't read it, so I feel like I can't talk, can't pair them directly. It's Ten Thousand Saints. Ten Thousand Saints. Uh, it is also set in the East Village in roughly the same time period that Rent is takes place in. Uh, it also is a look at life, love, rock, drugs, uh, and young people who are rebelling and trying to find their place in the world. So I, I feel like that would be a natural pairing. Um, and on the other hand, if you want a book about bohemian life in New York City, I would recommend Kafka Was the Rage by Anatole Broyard. That is a wonderful book. It is roughly a half century earlier. It talks about New York City in the 50s and 60s, specifically the West Village. But it is does have that kind of bohemian sensibility that you find in Rent. Next let's talk about Avita and let's pair it with a book about an ambitious woman and talk about Bring Up the Bodies. Now things don't end very well for Anne Boleyn in this book as anyone with even a passing knowledge of history uh, can tell you, but since Avita's triumph was also short-lived I feel like they're a bit of a match. Uh, both women are clever, ambitious, and relentless as sharks. And it feels natural to go from one bo a book about uh, an ambitious woman to talking about a woman about a crime spree, and let's talk about the musical Chicago to get there, and then let's talk about American Heiress, the wild saga of the kidnapping, crimes, and trial of Patty Hearst by Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, it is a nonfiction book, but I feel like this book is not only a very thorough portrait of the heiress who became a pop cultural icon for all the wrong reasons, but it's also a fantastic snapshot of America in the 60s and 70s and all of the transitions that were happening at the time. And I think Patty's unexpected and surprisingly enduring hold on the American people really speaks to a lot of the same themes found in Chicago. Next let's go to Miss Saigon. Uh, now ever since it was released Miss Saigon has been criticized for some well-meaning but tone-deaf racial representations, and while the story is beautiful, it is, after all, based on the opera Madame Butterfly, those racial problems have plagued the show ever since. So what would be better to pair with this musical that has problems of racial representation than a graphic memoir that is actually told by someone who immigrated from Vietnam in the wake of the Vietnam War and who's, who deals with the ripple effects of trauma that involve being in Vietnam and being Vietnamese during the war and after. It, this is a story that is not filtered th through the eyes of white people and it is beautiful, it's heartfelt, it is intelligent, and like I said it really gets at the heart of the trauma that Vietnamese people would have experienced because of the war in ways that Miss Saigon can't. I like the, I, I do like the show Miss Saigon, but there really is no denying that it does have some problems in terms of representation and the best we could do absolutely does not. If you don't want a graphic memoir, you could also go with The Sympathizer, which was a Pulitzer Prize winner by, by Viet Ten Nguyen. Um, I personally did not like that book very much. I would go with this. Now let's talk about Avenue Q, and of course that is a funny satire, so what better book to pair with it than Election by Tom Perota. This is, I think, Tom Perota's shining moment as a novelist. Uh, this is a scathing look at America's damaged political process by telling the story of a high school government election gone horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, 20 years later, it still, unfortunately, feels all too accurate. It does very much get at the heart of something quintessentially American, and I, th I think it's a good pairing for that. And finally, let's close with Phantom of the Opera, which was one of the first two musicals I saw and which, again, like Les Mis, really dazzled my imagination as a child. And I want to suggest a book that I haven't read, Queen of the Night by Alexander Chi. So I feel like I can't. I feel like I could also talk about Bel Canto by Ann Patchett, but I've only read one book by Ann Patchett and I hated it. So I don't know if I'm ever going to get around to reading Bel Canto. So I feel like I can't talk about either one of those. So instead of going the opera route, I decided to go with a book about oddities, which is Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. This is the saga of the Banuski family. The Banuskis deliberately mess around with their own genetics. They're breeding their own sideshow. And it's about family and love and obsession 
in ways that kind of dovetail with Phantom of the Opera without actually pairing quite nicely. And again, if you want something that would probably be a bit more of a match, you can go with Queen of the Dance by Alexander Chi, but I'm sticking with stuff that I have actually read. That is the Favorite Musicals tag. If you have seen any of these musicals, you love them, I'd love to hear it. If you have other recommendations that you would say would tie in, I'd love to hear that as well. And as usual, I will be back again. Until then, happy reading.